Mm. Okay, dude. Please come in. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll be restarting. So uh, in the next uh, few sessions, uh, I'll be talking a bit more about uh, inference and learning uh, in biological systems. So I'll, I'll be restarting a bit from what uh, Alexandra has been talking. I'll be talking again about information theory, which is already mentioned. But first, uh, you know, I'd like to, to make sure we're all on the same page when it comes to inference and learning by reminding you of some of the, or not reminding you, maybe teaching you some of the basics of learning independently of uh, biological systems, okay? And try to see, you know, how we can use it in some uh, concrete biological examples. Uh, but I'll start with just uh, introducing a, you know, very simple concept, which is a uh, Bayes theorem, okay? So this, this is going to be the, the, the easy part of today's class, or uh, today's uh, lecture. So we, I'm going to ask you a simple question. So this is, uh, do you recognize this guy? Yes, okay, it's, uh, that's uh, Sherlock Holmes. So Sherlock Holmes uh, is actually 40 years old, and uh, at his age, you, you get a fairly high uh, probability of getting a prostate cancer. So yes, I mean, uh, he's that old, he has that risk. All the numbers I'm going to give are, are, are fake, so don't, don't take them seriously, it's just to make the point, okay? So now, you know, Dr. Watson, who, uh, as you know, is a doctor, comes to Sherlock Holmes and he tells him, look, uh, your, test, your test for prostate cancer came back positive. Okay, so that's, that's pretty bad news, right? But, you know, the, the, the test, uh, when you do have the prostate cancer, there's a 90% chance that the test will say that you're positive. On the other hand, Dr. Watson also says that when you don't have prostate cancer, there's a 5% chance that it will also come up positive. Okay, so essentially, in, um, it has a 95% accuracy when it comes to being negative, 90% accuracy when it comes to being positive, okay? Now, the question to you is, should Sherlock Holmes be really, really worried? Does he have prostate cancer? What do you think, I mean, the probability that he has prostate cancer is? I, I wrote the answer, but what's your, I, I, want, I want some wrong answers first. <laughs> Otherwise, there's no game, right? So, okay. So, what's your, what's your, what do you think? Uh, you know, there's a trap, so you won't fall for it, right? You, you're too smart for that. Okay. So, um, any idea? Okay. You, no, nobody wants to to take a risk. Okay. Um, so the answer, of course, is not that he has a 95% chance of having prostate cancer. So we, we, we can try and break this up a bit more, and then th th there will be a, a way to introduce a Bayes theorem. So I, I said, you know, there's a 90% of people don't have prostate cancer. Um, I'll call that A. and 1% uh, do. And then, you know, the, the, the test if the test is positive, I'll call that B plus. If it's negative, I call that B minus. Okay. So even if you don't know Bayes' theorem, you can try and think about it in terms of a decision tree, right? So in the following way, like you say, okay, first I'm asking, do I have cancer or not? And with 99% chance, the answer is no. And with 0.01, the answer is yes. Okay. Then I'm taking the test. So if I don't have it, in 95% of the case, 
I'll be I'll have a negative test. And in 5% of the cases, I get a positive test. Okay. I do the same thing here. So these are all the, all the possible outcomes. There are four of them. Now, Sherlock got a positive test. So he is in either one of these two situations, right? So if I want to know the total probability that he does have it, I need to know the probability of this, right? So what I write is just I write the probability of A plus B plus over that should be my probability of for Sherlock to have cancer. So what if I plug in the numbers? So I have 0 0.01 times 0.99. So I'll just multiply these two numbers. And here I need to add that number, so it's the probability that it didn't have cancer, times the probability that the test came positive anyway. So you do this simple algebra, and if you, if you do that, you find about 15%. OK, so it's much lower than you would expect intuitively if you had thought you know, the accuracy of the test is 95%. But in fact, because there are so few people who have prostate cancer, you end up with only 15% chance of having it, which is still bad. It's much larger than if you didn't have, if you hadn't taken the test or if you had had a negative test. It's much higher than that. But it's still uh, significantly small. So what is Bayes' theorem? By theorem tells the following. So this is your true status, whether you have cancer or not. And this is what you saw. This is the test. And Bayes' theorem will tell you that this probability, so here I was interested in the probability of having cancer, knowing that I had a positive test. But this is more general than that. Right, so what I've done here, I took the joint probability. This thing I, I broke up actually here implicitly as A plus, probability of, of having the condition, times the probability of having a, a positive test given I have the condition. Right, so this is that term. And here, it's a no, you can view it as a normalization, because I need to sum over all the possible conditions I had to get the probability of, ha of having a certain outcome of the test. OK? Excuse me. Yes? I'm confused that, uh, about the A plus means having cancer or not having cancer. Oh, that's because I, I, I got it wrong. Thank you.
Okay, so this thing here, this is, before I did the test, this is what I thought was the prevalence of the condition in the population. In other words, that's the probability of having the condition if you don't know anything else, if you haven't taken the test, right? And this is what we call the prior. And so prior, it's your prior knowledge or prior belief that you may have had the cancer in the first place. And this thing here, it's, it, in, it, if you like, it's your, it's your evidence. So that's, that's the information that's given to you by the test, right? And this, this is called the likelihood. And you have to understand it this way. It's the likelihood that you got a positive test or you got any outcome of the test given the true condition. Okay? So that's, that's what the likelihood means. This is usually viewed as a normalization. It doesn't really have a name because you, you can really renormalize by summing over all possible value of the unknown variable, right, A. And this is called the posterior. Why posterior? It's because you had your prior belief, so that's what you thought in, you know, in the beginning. Then you add your evidence to that, it's just multiplication. And then it's the posterior belief. This is what you know now that you've taken the test, you have that, right? So you can see how you can uh, generalize this. For instance, if uh, Sherlock took a second test, so assuming the second test is independent, you know, he wants to make sure he really has it, then you would have a second test, which you would call C, and you could make a decision tree where you would add new branches here, right? And in, in the, the Bayesian framework, you would just multiply by another factor, right? Sorry, I cannot hear. In the first example. Yes. For the test, I'm like, there's a 90% chance of that being right, and only 5% chance of that being wrong. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I made it asymmetric on purpose, because um, it, it, the probability of being wrong depends on, the, on your condition. Right, so th this would be called a, a false positive. This would be called a false negative. And uh, you, in general, they can be different. But also, it's in, in order not to confuse you, I make them different because these are really different probabilities. So they don't have to add up to one. They don't have to. No, no. This and this add up to one. But this and that don't have to have to add up to one. Now, this is the probability of being wrong. If you do have the condition, this the ten percent, and this is probability of getting it wrong. If you do have the condition, they don't have to sum up to one. All right. So let, let me give you a, another example of how to use uh, this kind of thing. So I should mention that uh, in many, many cases, you don't really have a good prior. You don't really know what to put for the prior. And so you don't have some prior knowledge of what you expect. So in that case, it's, it's quite often the case that you remove that thing, or you say it's flat. In other words, it's a constant. So you, you just take it away from the equation, and you just write that the probability that you saw something, that something is true, is just proportional to the likelihood. And so, in fact, you know, maybe you don't realize this, but we do, we do this all the time, even in physics. And I'll give you an example of that. So, uh, the simplest example is, okay, the, the general situation is that you see some, some data. You have some model of the world, right? And you, you're going to see some data. And what you really want to know is that you, have your, you see your data and you want to reconstruct what the world is. Okay? And this is a, a, a good application of Bayes theorem. You write that the probability of your model, given the data, is just proportional to the likelihood 
that the generator, the, that the data was generated by the model. And let me give you a very concrete example of this, right? So imagine you have a, you have a coin, and imagine it's a biased coin, okay? So you do uh, 10 coin tosses, let's say. And you get three heads. And you don't know anything about the, the bias of the coin, OK? So the question to you is, what do you think the probability of, of getting heads and, uh, and uh, tails is giving this outcome? What would be your naive guess? Of course, these are very small numbers, so it's not going to be significant. But what would be your naive guess? Can you the, the question is, you got three heads out of 10 to coin tosses. So the question is, what do you think the bias of the coin is? What's the, what's the chance of getting a head? Sorry, one at a time. 30%? What did you say? 10, 2, 3. 10. 1, 0. 10% chance. No. 10 combination. 10 combination. Oh, no, that's the number of possi possible. OK, right, OK. We're getting there, OK. <laughs> uh, OK, so there's a. Let's call P, it's the bias of the coin. So what we're going to do is that we're going to do something similar to what you're suggesting, I think. Which is we're going to write down this, the probability, sorry, this, that we got this outcome given my bias. So. Here, my model, what I would call model, is just P. P is the model of my coin. It's just the, the bias of the coin. Right? This is what the state of the world, if you like, that I would like to learn about. And this is my outcome. This is, my, this is, my, you know, this is what I see. Right? So you'd like to invert that. So first, simply, you say, well, it's the probability of seeing N. Yeah, so this would be the data. So I write pretty of n given p. And that's just simple combinatorics. I have n choose, uh, 10 choose 3 uh, possible combinations. And then I have p to the 3. OK, so that's the probability of heads, right? Is this, um, I mean, I, I could put the actual, num I could just put the variables here, it would be easier. All right. So I have, I have an n big n choose small n because I have all the possible uh, permutations of where the heads occurred in the, if I have an ordered list. So now I'm going to say I'm going to use bias theorem, but I assume I have no prior of on the no prior knowledge of a p. So I just say that probability of p given n is proportional to that, which itself. Now I want to write this as a function of p, okay. And if I look that this factor doesn't depend on p, so I'm just left with this. So this I'll call the likelihood. So 
So now if I, if I want to ask what's the most likely P that created this outcome, all I have to do is to maximize this likelihood with respect to my unknown, which is P, right? So it's known as the procedure of maximizing the likelihood. It's called maximum likelihood, and it's very uh, important concept in, uh, in any sort of machine learning. So all you do is that you look for the P that maximizes L of P. Okay, in practice, it's much, it's much more convenient to actually, maximizes, to actually maximize the logarithm. You'll see why in a second. Because if, if I write down the logarithm of that quantity, it's simply n log p plus 1 minus n log 1 minus p. And we'll do it this way because it, it has some nice scaling properties, which we'll see in a second. So what if, what if I do maximize this likelihood? Uh, can anyone tell me what the result will be without doing the calculation? I mean, I think I heard it before. What would be the result, you, do you think? 15? 50. <laughs> Why 50? I see, I think the fact that you say 50 is because you have a prior, that you think most coins are not biased, right? But here we're not putting a prior because we're doing maximum likelihood. So we don't know anything about the coin. It could be as biased as it, as it could possibly be. Okay, but you can actually do the calculation. And if you do that, you take the derivative of log of L respect to P gets you this is what you get. So 30%. I mean, it's very naive, right? Because as you know, if the coin was not biased, you could have gotten three, right? So one has to be a bit more careful than that. And maybe also consider the possibility that you know, the, the most likely is not the true one, right? So this is what you know, the, the true, when people say like they think in a Bayesian way, they, they could mean two things. They could mean that they really think that the prior is important. Right, so here we ignore the prior. But the other thing is that you want to consider the full probability distribution of this thing. So you can do this. So here I'm representing simply this quantity. So you see it has a peak at exactly 0.3. Its average is actually a one third, it's not really important. But it also has a large width, right? So when you said 50, 50 is not completely crazy, right? It's not really in the tail of the distribution. It, it is possible as well, right? So one thing that what we'd like to do, for instance, is, is try and, and see what's the amount of uncertainty I have in my estimate. So here I said 30 is the most likely, but what are the, what are the fluctuations, so to speak? So of course, you know, you, you could do a, you can do some sort of, you can do a fair amount of algebra with this simple form, but that just gives you a, a, a way that's a bit more general, and that can help you calculate this, the, the fluctuations in, in a more general setting. So 
The way you do it is that you rewrite this in this manner, right? So I mean, this is of course uh, trivial. So what you note is that here I write as the exponential of log likelihood. But if you look at the log likelihood, which I wrote here, I can rewrite it in this manner. And what you see here is that, you know, in terms of scaling, when you get a, many, a large number of experiments, so n is the number of experiments you did, so the number of coin tosses. When you have a large number, these numbers here should scale like 1, I mean, the, of the order of 1, right? So, so that the overall log likelihood scales like n. Okay? So this quantity, if you like, log likelihood is extensive. And so what that means is that I can do some sort of a, I can do a, an expansion of it. It's, it's sometimes called the saddle point approximation. But here there's no integral, so it's, it's a bit simpler. What I say is that this is about approximately equal to the value at the maximum, minus 1 half. I'm doing an expansion of this thing. So do you know why there's no first order term? Checking if you're following. Why is there no first? I'm doing a Taylor expansion here, right? Why is, is there no first order term? You need to speak louder. I really cannot hear you from back there. Exactly, right? So that's why there's no first order term. We're we at the maximum. So we, we're looking at our function here, I mean the log of it, and we're just expanding around the maximum with a parabola, okay? Uh, there's no minus, yes. Somebody else is following. <laughs> okay, but this thing is negative, right? So if you, if you truncate this expansion, then you end up with just a Gaussian distribution, right? And therefore, you can write things in this way. So I've just rewritten things. I mean, all of this was, I didn't, I didn't really bother about the normalization. At the end of the day, I want to bother about the normalization. I know the normalization of the Gaussian distribution is just this. And then I, I just rewrote things in this manner so you can really see the variance up here, right? So what this suggests is that the fluctuation between the true one and the one you guessed, the one you guessed is P star, the true one is P. On average, the mean square error, or the variance, 
would be given by sigma p, and therefore by this thing. So what this gives you is some sort of a recipe for if you do have the, the value of the likelihood, you can maximize the likelihood to know what, what is the true state of your world. But then you can also use, and that you do, you do the, take the, sec, the first derivative, but then you can also use the second derivative to calculate what are the fluctuations. So here, in fact, uh, we can do uh, the second derivative easily. So what is that? It's uh, but remember p star is actually n over n. So here I just took the second derivative, right? And if I plug that in, I'm just getting So here again, you see the, 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 the extensive uh, nature of, the, of that quantity, right? It scales with n. So this quantity will become larger and larger as you do more and more and more experiments. And that's important because to know the fluctuations, I'll take the inverse of that, which means that my fluctuations here in, in this case, I just you know replace will be P1 minus P over N. P star. So that you sort of know intuitively already. Like if you do N experiments, the uncertainty on whatever you measure, and here you're trying to measure the bias of that coin, it should go like 1 over square root of n, right? I mean, you've heard that before, right? If you, for instance, if you, do, if you uh, run a poll, a political poll for elections, you know that if you have a sample of 1,000, then you know that you, know, you should expect fluctuations of the order square root of, uh, of 1,000, right? So here, in a way, we rederive this. We want to know the true fraction of people who would vote for x or y, but what we have is just a, a finite sample. And this formula tells you what you expect the error to be. Right? So it's not exactly 1 over n. It's modulated by this. But you know, that's essentially the idea. OK. Um, so maybe I'll give a second example, which is uh, maybe closer to what we, we do uh, on a regular basis in physics. And it's a linear regression. Uh, is everything okay so far? I mean, some of, some of this you, you may already know, but just want to make sure we... Okay, so let, let's, let's imagine we doing a polynomial fitting. Well, actually, before that, sorry, I, I first start with the linear regression. 
So let's imagine you have data points like this. If you did experiments, you, mod you, you, you changed your x, and this is what you got for y, right? Now you think that this probably follows a linear relation, right? So how do you find the coefficient of, the lin of that linear relationship? You minimize the mean square error, right? That's, that's the final answer. So can we, can we try and think about this in, in this probabilistic, probabilistic manner, in this Bayesian way, to see whether we find the same result, right? So here, you know, of course, like the 30% we got was also the intuitive answer. You got 30% of the outcome to be that. You know, that's what you get, right? But you can rationalize it with this uh, maximum likelihood. What happens here, right? So you have to make a few assumptions. You have to, uh, to mo model explicitly how your data was generated. So explicitly, I make the following assumption. I said that, OK, I, I, I think. I have a linear relationship between x and y, OK? But if that were just the case, then they would all fall exactly on a straight line. I wouldn't have to ask myself, you know, how do I find the best fit? So what I'll do is that I'll add some noise. So I have my end data points. And add some noise, and I have to make some, the noise is essentially, you know, what, what makes the difference between the linear, exact linear relationship and the point you actually observe. And I'll make an assumption. I'll say that EI is Gaussian. I assume it has mean 0. And it has some variance, sigma squared. OK. So what if now I turn this in terms of likelihood? What is my likelihood? It's the P of my data given the model. Well, what is my model here? Really, it's the coefficients of my linear relationship. What is the data? Well, I assume I also know my xi, right? So here I should also say n my xi. But also here, you notice that in the model, there's also the noise itself. That's part of my model. At least from the probabilistic point of view, it's part of my model. OK, so th this is what I call my model. Now, if I write this down, what is the property of xi given, of yi given xi and the parameters of the model? Well, it's just a Gaussian distribution. OK, so my log likelihood, so this is my likelihood, would just be OK? So I've just written the log of what was here. Is this clear, right? 
maybe I should say like this, because the property of my EI is given by a Gaussian with these parameters, uh, epsilon i, it's this, right? And then I, I replace epsilon i by this, so I just replaced, okay? When I take the log, I look at this, and I want to maximize my likelihood with respect to the parameters of my model. And it, let's start with A and B. If I try to maximize with respect to A and B, it's like minimizing this quantity because I have a minus sign here. So what do I want to minimize? The mean square error. Because this is the empirical mean square error, right? So, And then you also see why I should take the log, right? Because that way you really see a sum. So this whole thing here, it's n times mean square error. OK, so you can see here, actually, what we say we, what we should do is minimize mean square error. In fact, what, we, what we're really saying is that we think that our noise is Gaussian. You can easily see that if we had assumed that the noise had a different form, like it had, for instance, in exponential tails or parallel tails or whatever, then when I take the log, this would immediately turn into a different uh, quantity to maximize, to, to minimize, that would depend on the, on the statistics of the noise. So mean square error really means Gaussian noise. In many cases, it's very reasonable, but it's, it's always good to keep in mind that that's an assumption. Now, just in passing, like if you, I said, in principle, the noise is also an unknown of your model, right? So if you don't know it, you can actually also minimize, maximize the likelihood with respect to the noise level itself. And if you do that, well, you can see, like, you get, uh, I take in the relative with respect to, to sigma squared, right, to simplify. You see that sigma star squared is equal to this, <coughs> to two-line calculation. Uh, Not so surprising, the noise that you infer is actually the empirical noise that you measure, right? So the difference between, and here I should have stars, right? Between your fit and your data. So th there's also a nice way to think about this in, in, in physical terms. So what we're doing here is we, we try to draw a line through this. Now you can think of this uh, log likelihood as some sort of an energy, if you like, right? So we try to minimize, maximize the, the log likelihood. So what if you call this your Hamiltonian? Sorry, minus your Hamiltonian, so that you minimize your Hamiltonian, meaning maximizing the likelihood. So when I write down this kind of Hamiltonian, you see here I have many quadratic potentials. So it's as if I took all my points and I put some springs to each of them that I connect to my line. Right? What this says, when I do this minimization, 
that I'll choose, so I, you know, I, sorry, I'm not going to draw all the strings, but you imagine a string for each, each uh, data point that's connected to the line. And then I let the spring, uh, so the resting, the resting position of the springs is actually uh, you know, zero in that case. And then I just let the spring relax. Right? I'm looking for the ground state, so the, the thing of minimal energy. It would be the mean square error. Right? So if I, if I do this physical setup, then my line, which I let free, will eventually settle for, to the best fit. Right? So th this is just to emphasize the fact that many of these uh, likelihoods or maximizing the likelihood can be rephrased in terms of, um, of a, 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 an energy minimization. And the analogy goes a bit further than that, because it's not just about the minimum, as we saw for the, for the previous case. It's also about the fluctuations or the uncertainty, right? So this is my likelihood of P. Sorry, no, it's not P in that case. Now it's A, B. All right, let's assume now for a second that I actually know sigma squared because I know my experimental uh, apparatus and I know what, how much noise it has, right? So let's assume I know sigma squared and I just want to know A and B. So if I write this thing down, now the way I've defined this is simply minus h, right? And this is like in Boltzmann law when I write that the probability distribution of, my con of whatever configuration I have is 1 over z and exponential minus kbt, OK? So here, you know, I can set the temperature to, to zero, to, to one by convention, but I can also say, you know, it's, it depends on sigma squared. So in that case, I would have to, uh, well, we'd have to re define a different Hamiltonian, which is differs from this one by just the, the sigma squared factor. But the idea is the following, though, right? When you write this down, you don't when you have the Boltzmann distribution, you don't necessarily assume that all your configurations will find themselves in the ground state. They'll find themselves in, this, in states depending on their energies, right, according to this formula. So here's the same thing. Like I don't assume that A and B necessarily are equal to A star and B star, which is the maximum of my, of my, of my likelihood. They could fluctuate exactly in the same way I calculated the fluctuations for P in the previous example. Here, I can also calculate fluctuations for A. But you can see the analogy is that the fluctuations, the uncertainty I have about A and B can be rephrased in terms of fluctuations in this, uh, in this uh, statmec uh, setting. Okay? So that's why I'm saying it goes a bit further than just the maximum. It's also about calculating the fluctuations. Uh, so in that case, in fact, the fluctuations, they, they're fairly, uh, you know, fairly easy. So I can take this, and you can, what you notice is actually this, this thing here, log L is quadratic in A and B, okay? So that means that, in general, I'll be able to write this as in the following manner. Okay. 
my a here is just the second derivative, of course, of uh, my log likelihood, the minus sign. And it's simply equal in that case to, to that. And my b, sorry, uh, it's equal to n. So you, you can you can check this by just expanding these guys and, and regrouping the terms in a squared, uh, a b and the cross terms. Okay, so you can calculate them. The, the point is that the, each of these quantities scales with n again, right? So this is important point because the likelihood itself scales with n. And the second point is that, again, when I look at this, it's just a Gaussian distribution, right? So what that means is that I can now calculate the uncertainties. So the uncertainty is the expected error by just using Gaussian integration rules. Okay, so I have Gaussian integration, so I need to have a quadratic form inside the exponential, and I know that my fluctuations would just be given by the inverse of that quadrat of the coefficients of that uh, quadratic form. Okay, is that is that okay with every, everybody? Just uh, Gaussian algebra. Again, you know, the point is that this scales like 1 over n, right? Because each of these guys scales with n, I'm taking the inverse. So now with my analogy, yes? That better? Yeah. So now I'm coming back to my to my spring analogy, right? And I say I just don't want you know. I, I imagine that I really have a, a huge fluctuate. You know, in the spring analogy, of course, you you reach the ground state because the thermal fluctuations are small. But now I'm also adding the thermal fluctuations. And I see how my line fluctuates, right? And saying how my line fluctuates, to describe this, I need to know this, this covariance matrix between the parameters that describe my line, right? And here I can do it simply by taking the, the, the Haitian, so the second derivative, at the maximum of my Hamiltonian, of my log likelihood, the, the minimum of the Hamiltonian. It turns out it's much more general than that. Like now, imagine that it's not just about this Gaussian case or anything like that. So here, everything is exact, meaning that this is exactly Gaussian. In the previous example, you saw I had to do some some truncation of the of the Taylor expansion, right? In general, if I have some 
a set of parameters. So my parameters before were A and B, but now I say I have parameters uh, theta 1 up to theta k, right? So I have more than two parameters. I can have any time k parameters. Then I can always write my likelihood. I can always write it in this manner. So I do, again, a tether expansion. And I can do a tether expansion because this scales with n. Right? So it's, again, the same saddle upon approximation as before. And so the general statement is that the covariance of theta k and theta k prime which is, by definition, is this. Again, simply using Gaussian integration rules is given by this. OK, so let you write this down. This is, this is not you know, so important. It's just a generalization to any non-Gaussian statistics and also to a multivariate. Right? OK, so th this was just a linear fitting. Let me just tell you a bit, just to continue on this. You know, you could have thought that these points were not actually distributed on the line. It could be that your points were, you know, had some sort of curvature. In that case, you may be tempted to think that it's not a line, but maybe it's a quadratic function. So how, do you, how should you decide this, right? And so let me just give you, a, you know, maybe a, a, a cautionary tale. I'm not going to go into the details of the calculations. But let's say that your points are, are like this, OK? So you have points that are, you know, there's quite a lot of noise. You don't know whether it's a, it's a line or anything like that. But let's say that you have good reasons to assume that it's a polynomial. You just don't know the order of the polynomial, OK? So then the parameters of your model will simply be the coefficients of your polynomial, let's say your thetas. So you can try and fit a polynomial of, uh, so OK, sorry, that's, that's the true value of the polynomial that generated the data. And here what I did is I, I took a, th a third order polynomial and then generated data using a similar rule as this, adding some Gaussian noise, OK? But that, if you want to do a fit, if you do a linear fit, you'll find this. If you do a quadratic fit, you find this. If you do a, a third order polynomial fit, you find this. And if you add more and more order, you get closer and closer, right? So let me play that again. You get closer and closer to your points. The problem is, as you know, the more order you add, the more parameters you add, the closer you'll get, right? In fact, you, you, you can show mathematically that if you had, let's say here, 15 points, a polynomial of order 15 will fit all the points exactly, right? Is that the right polynomial? No. Here, the, the right polynomial is order of order 3, actually. So uh, how, do we, how do we do this in practice? Because how do we know where to stop? So this is just uh, 
another way of saying it, like here I calculated the mean square error, so the error between my polynomial and my data points, and I, I increase the order of the polynomial, it drops, eventually will go to zero, right? Now, the, the simplest way to deal with this is to, to separate your data into two sets. One will be called a training set, another one a testing set. So the idea is the following, that you take, let's say, two thirds of your data, let's say half of your data to, to simplify, and you use that half to fit your polynomial. Then you take your polynomial and you try to see whether it predicts well the second half of the data, which is independent, right? And the reason why this might work is because the, the, what happens when you get to this situation, when you get to this situation is that you, you basically overfit the noise. So you're trying to fit the noise of your, of your data, right? So this is in the testing data. But if you're really fitting the noise, then if you test it on an independent realization of the data on the, on the testing set, then you get it completely wrong, right? Because you were trying to fit the particular features of the noise of the training data. Uh, that makes sense. So, so you, you, you can test this by now you add the testing data. So in, in black are the points that are used to fit my polynomial. But in green, it's new points, so I did new experiments with the same uh, polynomial, which the true polynomial, I remind you, is of order three. And I just generated these points, and then I see whether the polynomial I learned with the black one is a good predictor of the green one, right? So I, I can, it's, a, it's the same animation as before. And the point is that now I can look at the mean square error on the green points instead of looking at it on the, on the black points. So for the black points, by definition, it had to go down because I'm adding more parameters and getting more and more precise. But as you can, you can see here, on the green points, it will actually first go down, and then eventually it will go up, right? Why is that? It's because basically, by, by the time I get to 15, my polynomial is just trying to fit the noise of the black ones and we'll have no predictive power for the green ones, right? So it goes back up. So I'm not going to go, so you can formalize this a bit better using probabilistic uh, thing. I'm not going to go into the details. This is usually a good procedure to know that you're doing things right, right? So here, in fact, I chose my example well. This thing here has the minimum at three, which is the true, the true answer, right? So here it, it tells you you should, you should stop at three. Maybe you won't do so bad by going up to five, but after that, you know, it becomes catastrophic. Um, so I'll skip that. All right, let, let me just, we will ta we'll take a break in two minutes. But let me just motivate now why we went through the, the pain of this. So. It's usual to think, so this base, base law and maximum likelihood and trying to learn about the world from the data, it can be relevant in, at, at many different scales, if you like, in many different uh, ways. So first of all, as a scientist, right? So we, we gave the example of fitting uh, you know, experimental data. This is, this is one example like this, that we have data and we like to learn about the world. So you know, we will use mean square error is basically a maximum likelihood. So it's useful to just infer the parameters of a system from the data. It's quite, you know, I mean, of course, fitting is quite usual, but usually as a theorist, what we do, we do the other way around, right? We, we start from the model, and then we calculate whatever, right? We calculate correlation functions or, or other parameters, and then we see what it gives, and then, you know, that we look at these predictions, and we ask, you know, does it, does it make sense? Does it, it de describe the phenomena I wanted to describe? So this is what I would call a bottom-up approach. Like you start from the microscopic equations and you try to calculate the, you know, what happens. So this is what I did when I generated data with the, in the, in the previous uh, example, with the, this, uh, this, this fake data here. This is what I did, right? I had my model, I generated data with it. And in effect, you know, in theoretical physics in particular, this is very often what we do. Like, we start from a model, we try to solve it, we try to simulate it. Now, 
there's another way, which is I would call top-down, is that you start from the observations. And this is what you do when you fit. You start from the observations, and you're going to try and solve for the parameters of the model that gave rise to these observations. And uh, in, in the next lectures, not today, I'll show you examples of how you do this and how it's useful, especially in biology, where usually you have very little idea what this could be. Right? In physics, even, you don't really often have a very good idea what this should be. And for this, you use huge simplifications of models. But in biology, you know, often you have almost no idea. Or like what the microscopic details you know from biology are kind of useless to describe the sort of noise and, and variations you have in the data. So we see examples of that. Uh, and how we, we can use this kind of maximum likelihood and, and, and things like that to, to do this. But I just want to mention that it's, uh, yeah, I mean, this is an inverse problem. It's called an inverse problem because you, you do the inverse of the usual way. Uh, but, you know, Bayesian thinking is, it has become popular in, the, you know, in general, even in the general public. For instance, uh, this... Uh, this uh, statistician, Nate Silver, in the States, who uh, runs a website, who tries to learn, to, to tries to forecast, uh, you know, presidential elections, but also uh, sport results, based on previous observations and also based on polls and based on all sorts of data. Right. So his way of thinking is that he should take into account all the, you know, the history of what happens, and put all of that in your prior, and then treat the polls as evidence. But also, you need to include the, the noise that there is in the polls in the evidence. And then you put that into a big model. And then you do your big model, and you, you simulate your model. You try to back out what's the probability that you know, either one of the two candidates will win. I'm mentioning this because, uh, in fact, you know, he, he used very Bayesian thinking. He even wrote a book to explain why Bayesian thinking is good. It's called The Signal, the Signal and, and the Noise, and I, I recommend it. And uh, you know, using this, these ideas, you know, he, he came up with uh, about almost 30% chance for uh, uh, Donald Trump to win. At the time, I don't know if you remember, most, most other political websites that had forecast of the election gave a 99% 90, chance uh, of winning for Hillary Clinton. Right? And you know, because he was taking the noise much more seriously, especially the polling errors and stuff like that, and correlations between uh, polling errors, he could get something that's, uh, that was a bit closer to the truth, right? You could still say that, okay, he still predicted that she was more likely to win, but when you get a 30% chance of something bad happening, you, you know that usually it does, right? <laughs> so this is what happened here. Um, and then, and this is what I'm going to talk maybe next, it's also important for living organisms, right? So we humans do Bayesian thinking, but we're not the only ones. Uh, if you think about, for instance, catching a target that's flying, right? You, you need to use Bayesian thinking. And the reason is the following. is because even a frog, when it sees an insect, it sees it with a delay. I mean, it's the same for you. You see something, like you say you, you play tennis and you see a ball coming at, you know, your way. Uh, the moment it will actually get to your brain for you to process, there will be a few tens of seconds of delay, right? And yet, you don't have the impression that you know, the ball was coming and you know, before you realized it was here, it was already in your face. Usually, you can anticipate, right? So what does it mean anticipating? Here, in that case, that means you have a model of the world in your brain and the model of the ball moving. You know its speed, so you have some prior knowledge of where it should be next, right? And in fact, that's what you use to know where it is. And in fact, in terms of sensation, you think you know where it is here. You, you think you see it here whereas actually you haven't seen it yet, right? So for the frog, it's very important because then it will you know, throw its tongue at the insect and get it. And to, to, to do this task precisely, it absolutely needs to have a model where the fly is going. So this will be what we see next. Does biology care about maximum likelihood? But we first take a, a short break, like uh, 10 minutes, five minutes. <laughs> is the bad guy uh, uh, you know, out here? <laughs> OK, so let's start again. So, so I already gave you an example with the frog. Let me tell you about chemotaxis. So does any one of you know what chemotaxis is? 
Yes? Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> Tell me what it is. <laughs> Speak loud. <laughs> Exactly, right. The batteries go to the food. For finding food? Yes, exactly. So it's not just food. Let me give you an example. This is a movie. I forgot to credit it, by the way, sorry. Uh, and I hope it works. Yes. Okay, so this is a movie by David Rogers from the 50s. And this is blood. Okay? So what you see here is a, is a big... Uh, blood cell called the neutrophil. Here you have red blood cells. And the, the, the job of neutrophils is to eat up bacteria that have been marked for deletion, right? So it's, it's basically a big monster that wants to eat anything that you know, it, it's, uh, it's attracted to. And here in black, this small dog here is the bacterium, right? So it's much smaller than this, this cell. And of course, the immune system wants to get rid of that bacterium that's in the blood. And you see, the cell will actually move, will track the bacterium. And the way it does it is because the bacterium is secreting some chemicals that this big cell is sensitive to. And therefore, it can track it and chase it until eventually, yum yum, yummy yummy, <laughs> it eats it up. Okay. So how does it do that? That's chemotaxis. That's that's the that's an example. So like, you see, you know, the bacteria, the, the the big cell here, is seeing something, right? That's the you know something about the world that there's a bacterium out there. How does it decide where to go? Okay. So it's. You can view it you know, in a Bayesian way if you like, but this is basically the task it's doing. So this is, of course, a big cell. Like you saw the bacterium here is like a, a few uh, micrometers. And then this, this cell here is, 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 fair, is much, much larger than that, like several tens of uh, micrometers. But in fact, even bacteria themselves also do chemotaxis. So this is like, a, let me show you an, uh, an experiment. Fed, I mean, not too old, like from 2003. The previous movie was from the 50s. And this is based on microfluidics. So what they did here is that they had some, some microfluidic device where they, they would basically pump in some what they call chemoeffectors. So chemoeffectors is basically what the bacteria like, right? So they'd be attracted to it. And so they let them go through here and then they let them out through here. And because of that, it would create a gradient. So you have more chemoeffectors in the upper part of the chamber than in the lower part of the chamber. And in, here in the middle, right in the middle, they pump in some bacteria. Right? And they want to know where they will end up. Right? So they, they push bacteria, and then bacteria will come out of these small pipes. So the idea, of course, is that if bacteria are sensitive to the chemoeffectors, you should see more, more bacteria in this uh, pipe here, in this outlet, than in this one. OK? Is the experimental setup clear? So and th these are the results. So uh, the curves, are unfortunately, are not, are not very well done. But uh, this line here is when they put no attractant at all. So they don't put any chemoeffector, uh, right? And you can see it's perfectly centered around zero, right? So this is the distribution of cells as a function of the channel number in each of these channels. Like this is 1, and this is 21. But then if they add the chemo effector, and they can show this for a concentration as low as 3.2 nanomolars, so nano is 10 to minus 9. And it's this curve here, which I'm trying to outline. Then it's biased towards the low channels, which means that the bacteria are actually sensitive to these very low concentrations of the chemoeffector. 
And that begs the question of, you know, how do they do that? But to see, to, to really understand how extraordinary this, this, uh, this feature of, of uh, so here it's the E. coli, uh, the most studied bacterium, as you know. How does it, you know, to really understand how extraordinary it is, you, you need to do a, a small calculation first. So the first one is a calculation of order of magnitude. Do, do you know what, what a nanomolar is? It's, it's pretty abstract. So nanomolar is actually 1 is 10 to minus 9 mol per liter, right? Now, I have my bacterium. What is the size of a bacterium? It's a micron, yes. Because it's called microbes, that's why. <laughs> so let's say it's about you know, one micron. So if I, if, I, if I put this E. coli into a, a bath of, of, a chemi of, a, of chemo attractors, or the chemo effectors, right? So I have my chemo effectors. One nanomolar, do you know, you know, does it correspond to what I drew here, or do it correspond to many, many, many cell, you know, many, many molecules, very well concentrated, or what, what, what would that correspond to? Do you have any idea? It's not an easy question, either you, you've seen this before or not. Okay, I'm gonna give you, give you the answer. So you can calculate this, of course. You have mole per liters, you can convert that into molecules per square meters, right? So how do you do this? Well, you have to multiply by Avogadro numbers. And you multiply by three, because they are by 10 to the three, because there's a thousand liters in each square meters. Uh, cube meters, sorry, cube meters. So that, that's a big number. But that doesn't really tell me, you know, at the scale I'm interested in. So I can convert this into micrometers cube. Okay, so you see actually, I started from Avogadro number, which is very large, but when I'm looking at this scale, there's going to be in the volume of, let's say, one, mini, one micron, so, you know, volume of one micron cube, I will have at most one molecule on average. So here I am, a small bacterium of the order of one micron, and this bacterium is sensitive to concentrations as low as uh, three nano Models, which means something like maybe two molecules would be present in its body if it was transparent, right? So you, you see really it's quite a, a remarkable they can actually detect not only the concentration, the presence of the chemoattractant, but can detect its gradients. We can detect differences in it. Because of course if you, if, if you had chosen a different setup, where the concentration of the chemoattractant was constant in the chamber, you would not expect any bias, right? So it really has to know about the difference. So now immediately we can ask the question of, well, I mean, this, is, this looks like it's going to be difficult to do this task for the bacterium, right? So you, you, can, you can try and, and calculate what's the best possible estimate of concentration 
see the, back, the bug could achieve. So we'll see a bit later that, in fact, what, what a bacterium does is it has some receptors <coughs> that will bind these, uh, these molecules and that, that will create some activity in the cell, right? And we'll see it a bit more uh, in, the, in the next lecture. But all the bacterium sees is the state of its receptors, whether they're bound or not to something, right? This is what they see. But what they want to know is something about the concentration. So this is a bit, we're a bit back to the, you know, maximum likelihood of Bayesian uh, framework. Like, the bacterium wants to know something about the world. Here the world is, where is, where is the food? It wants to know what the food is. So it wants to know what the concentration of food is at a given moment. And what it has is just has this, this measurement device, right? Question? Can you repeat uh, what the question you have? Uh, this is a very polite way of saying that my writing is terrible. <laughs> What's the best possible estimate of concentration C the bacterium could achieve? Okay, so it's a calculation that was done by Berg and Purcell in the 70s. This is what we'll do now. Yes. Oh, that's a good point, yes. The board is not high enough, right? So Berg and Purcell asked themselves that question. They said, okay, I have my bacterium. So let's say idealize my bacterium, let's say it's just uh, you know, some volume, so some, some object of dimension A. And then it, it's, 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 uh, it's based in a, in a chemoattractant, which is a soluble quantity that's in concentration C. And the question is, How can this small object estimate C? So do you have an intuition for what it should depend on? Size A. It should depend on size A. It should also depend on C. OK, so there's two parameters I wrote down, so <laughs> congratulations. OK, let's start with this, OK? The first thing we can ask is, what, OK, we do an idealization, but the, the true uh, thing will not be so different. Let's assume that a measurement device of size A is actually transparent, right? So it's a sphere, or it's a cube, let's say. And it lets the, the ligand go in and out, right? And all it can do is I can count how many ligands there are inside the volume, right? So let's call it N. the ligands inside, and I have to be very, very careful about the way I write. So that's the number of ligands inside volume A3. And you see this is a stochastic quantity, right? Because the, the ligands, they don't stay where they are. You know, they, just stay, they don't stay in, in place. They're in water, in a solution. So this will fluctuate. What is, what is the average value of n, though? Do you know? You need to speak louder. Yes? Yes. So the average value of n is c times a cube. 
What are the fluctuations of n? Any idea? How is n distributed? It's, it's Poisson distributed, is that what you said? Yes. It's distributed according to a Poisson, okay? So, right? It's like you put points and run, you know, you put your molecules in random places with density C, right? So the, the amount that will find itself in a given volume is Poisson distributed, right? Is that okay with everyone? Otherwise, I could rederive it, but there's no time for that, for, so <laughs> I won't. I'll just take that for granted. So essentially, okay, but we don't really care about the, the particular form. What we really want to know is the fluctuations. Should maybe a, okay, and the fluctuations of a Poisson yeah, okay, sorry, I, I just ignore what you said, sorry. So the fluctuations are equal to the mean, that's the one of the features of the Okay. But now if I'm a cell, all I know is n. That's, that's the only piece of information I have about the world, right? So, you know, I put this in parentheses because I won't use it, but you have p of n given c. Uh, you know, the cell, we want to know, we want to maximize this. This is n given c over c. Essentially, what, they will, what this will give you for the maximum likelihood estimate made by the cell is that its best guess is just the number of molecules inside the volume divided by the volume, right? If you think about it, it's very similar to the head and tails kind of thing, right? You just, it's the empirical frequency. Right? So here's the empirical concentration. But now if you, if you want to know the fluctuations of that guy, so I call that delta C squared, they're going to be and especially if I'm interested in the relative fluctuations, the relative fluctuations in my estimate would just be equal to the relative fluctuations in N itself, right? just simply because they're proportional. And this, by virtue of the fact that the fluctuations of n, so that this is delta n squared, are on the order of n, Again, no surprise, low large numbers. The, the, the error I will make on my estimate will go like one over the number of observations. Here I observe n molecules inside the volume, so this is the error I make. Okay. In that case, it's just proportional to this. Now, this is pretty lousy if you think about it, right? Because now if I still have uh, two molecules per, as I said, in the case of three nanomotors, I have two molecules per cell. Two molecules per cell means that this number is one over two. 
So my estimate of concentration is very, very poor, right? Because my relative fluctuations are the order of one, of one half. So it's, that's pretty bad. It's unlikely the cell is going to be able to find the food that way. Also because the cell doesn't do this, it doesn't count things, it has receptors, as I said, so it's a bit more complicated. There's not receptors everywhere. So it's not, a, you know, this is like an idealized measurement device, but in practice it will be uh, a much poorer device, okay? So what else can the cell do to improve its uh, estimate of the concentration? You need to speak very loud because otherwise I just hear. Huh? Well, it could do that, but let's say that it doesn't have a prior yet, right? Because for a long time. Do the for a long period. Right. So what you can do is that you can wait. Because the thing is that these, these ligands in the, this uh, idealized situation, these molecules, they'll diffuse in and out. Okay? So I add two parameters to my thing. One is diffusion coefficients. And the other one is the time of observation. So the time of observation, it, it's basically, it corresponds to the following situation is that at some point, you know, I have my cell and I have three, like, you know, I have my, sorry, not the cell, it's the idealized measurement device of size A, and I have, let's say, th these three ligands into it, and then I wait, oh, this would be time, and then I'll get, I, or, you know, these guys diffused out, maybe this one stayed, and then, you know, a, a new guy came in, right? So it, it diffuses, so it changes. And I want, I, want to, I want to make measurements that are, that are independent of each other, right? Otherwise, I'm counting the same molecule several times. So, where, you know, let's say I'll do... K measurements. Let's say this is I equal 2. And then I do a third measurement. And I do K measurements, okay? So now my observations... Uh, N1, the number of, of ligands at, at, in this first measurement, N2, until Nk. And now it's, let's assume that these measurements are actually independent, right? What should I do if I want to estimate the, the concentration from these measurements? Yeah, exactly, right? I take my C star, I take 1 over K, sum over nk. So it's the same as this, right? I just take the mean. Uh, fortunately, if I did P of C given, and so I do my Bayesian stuff, and I do maximum likelihood, Sorry, I, I used K and I, um, sorry. It should be small K here to be consistent. So this will be maximum likelihood. Is my, each of my measurements, the fact that this probability factorizes is the fact that my measurements are independent of each other. And if I do this and I do, I take the derivative with respect to C equals zero, I find exactly that, right? You can show that. I won't show it, but intuitively, that's what you expect. Now, if I calculate the fluctuations of that guy, so my dc squared, so it's the same thing as here. If we now
be the sum of my fluctuations. Okay, so I have this quantity. These guys fluctuate still, right? These are random variables. So if I want to know what error I'm making here, I need to see what errors I'm making in each of those, and then I sum those up. And each of these guys is equal to 1 over n. And I have k of them. So 1 over n k divided by a6. So then I define the n which is, you know, that the total number of, of independent measurements I made. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is n. There's average here. OK. The algebra may seem complicated, but it's actually really not. Uh, you just need to put all things together, and the results, the final result is very intuitive. The relative error I make is still proportional to the number of things I saw, but now accumulated over time. Right, so it's the number of measurements and the average number of, of, uh, of molecules I see in each measurement. So that's the total number of molecules I saw that are distinct from each other. Again, law of large numbers, you expect that, right? Okay, so I have an n uh, average. It was given here. But I don't have my k. And I need k as a function of my two physical parameters, which is the time I waited. and the diffusion coefficient. So can you give, give me a, can you give me a guess for what k should be? And uh, any idea? This will be the last thing I do, don't worry, we soon have lunch. If somebody answers me, you know, we can have lunch earlier, so motivation. No? Okay. So, so we, we had a, a total time of measurements of t, right? I have k measurements during that time t, so all I need to know is the amount of time here between two independent measurements, so I'll call that tau. OK? Then k would just be equal to t over tau. All right? We agree on that. So now we, all we need to know is tau. Tau, as I said, it's, you know, it's, it's the time it takes to really make an independent measurement. In effect, it means it's the time I need for all the molecules that are here to diffuse out and new molecules to diffuse in. Right? So I need to renew the content of my measurement device. How long does that take? Okay, right. So not not quite, but uh, can you can can you guess by dimensional analysis, right? I have I have d. What else do I have? I have a, and I want to know tau. Tau. Okay. So how do I do this? No. <laughs> what well, the, the diffusion usually? Yeah, like you should have something like this, right? OK, that distance squared diffusion times time, right? So, so I'll guess my tau 
And one can actually do a rigorous calculation. This is what Bug and Purcell did with the, a measuring device, where you really cal you know, you calculate the Green's function of the diffusion coefficient. You can do all of this, and you, at the end of the day, you get the same, essentially the same result as what I got. But this is it. And now I'm piecing everything together. I said my relative error is equal to 1 over nk. So it's 1 over a3 c t with the tau here. And I replace my tau. And I should say, you know, this is really only approximate. So this is the result, right? And you can see here that, okay, things scale normally. Like, the, the longer you, you wait, the more you accumulate evidence. So the better your accuracy will be. The larger the concentration, the more molecules you'll see and be able to count. So it also improves. The faster the diffuse, the more independent events you get during a given time. So that's also OK. The A here is a bit less trivial, because you can see it's actually, it, it comes out of this calculation. You, you think, if I, if I have a large volume, I can count more up to, you know, up to the volume. And this is what we had in the previous estimate. It would go like a, 1 over A cube. But if I have a larger volume, it will take longer for the, for the molecules to, to uh, be renewed. And this is this A square. Right? It, it turns out that the volume wins, but so that I only have A here, so like the cubic root of the volume instead of just having the volume. So that's it uh, for today. Uh, tomorrow, we'll, uh, we'll see how the bacterium actually uses uh, these estimates to move towards the food.